Well, good afternoon and welcome to the CS Week Women in Utilities webinar series. I'm Lisa Collins with CS Week. We want to encourage you to mark your calendars for the Sunrise event at Conference 43 in Phoenix, Arizona. It's coming up shortly, April 10th. This program will be recorded and available for playback along with our other archive presentations. You will find it by selecting the Women in Utilities tab under the webinars menu choice on the csweek.org homepage. Attendees are encouraged to upload questions to the Q&A panel as they arise. However, we'll hold them and we'll have a Q&A segment towards the end of the presentation. Please ensure that you address your questions to all panelists so that I can capture them. And I'd like to introduce now our moderator for today's webinar, Christina Schunemann with our webinar sponsor, AAC Utility Partners. Welcome, Christina. Well, hi, everyone. Um, and thank you so much, Lisa. I hope everyone's having a great afternoon or, or late, uh, late morning if you're on the West Coast like me. Um, today is a really exciting webinar. We're going to um, be discussing Mastering the Art of Leadership. Um, and I'm very excited today to have uh, Aleda Sakaris. I'm sorry, Aleda, if I got that wrong. Um, Aleda Sakaris, she's the VP of Chesapeake Utilities. Um, and with over 30 years of energy experience, Ms. Sakaris is responsible for the operations of Chesapeake Utilities Corporation, Delmarva Natural Gas Distribution, and Sandpiper Energy Businesses, which are located in both Delaware and Maryland. And Aleda is responsible for setting the strategic direction for the business and delivering on key business and performance objectives. She leads a diverse group of business leaders who consistently achieve outstanding results for the corporation. Um, prior to joining Chesapeake Utilities Corporation, Ms. Sokaris previously held various positions at Florida Public Utilities Company, including the Assistant Vice President of Marketing and Energy Logistics and Director of Sales and Marketing. Um, prior to that, she managed Tico Partners, an unregulated sales and marketing subsidiary of Tico People's Gas. Um, Ms. Sakaris also holds leadership roles on multiple energy and nonprofit organization boards. So um, I hope, like me, you guys are all really excited to learn from Aleda today. And so with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over um, to Aleda. Thank you, Christina. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here with you today. I'm going to be sharing some of my own stories and the stories of other women's journey in the leadership, and I hope that you will find uh, my presentation um, interesting and that you will walk away with some, some tips and ideas. Um, as Christina mentioned, I'm the Vice President for Chesapeake Utilities, and I've been with Chesapeake uh, for the last eight years. Chesapeake is an energy company with operations in Delaware, Maryland, Florida, Ohio, and Pennsylvania and I lead the company's natural gas regulated utilities in Delaware and Maryland. Um, and, but I've been in the industry for close to 30 years. So I will start out by saying that I cannot teach you to be a leader in an hour. Um, and also, I'm pretty sure that if you're participating in this webinar, you're already a leader. Whether it's in the political arena, or perhaps it's in your community or in your place of worship, in your church, or perhaps if you're a member of this group, you're in a business environment where you lead a group of one or maybe even hundreds. And definitely, I know that you probably have experience in leading yourself or your family, or perhaps a significant other. In any case, you're already a leader, whether you know it or not. Next slide, please. There's Superwoman swooping right in to let you know you are already a leader. What you're probably looking for uh, is a magic formula that will have others seeing you as a leader and recognizing that great leadership, the, the great leadership traits that you have in you. Well, I also don't have a magic formula, but next slide. I can show you what leadership looks like. 
Using my own life examples and those of other women, I will hopefully give you some insights, tips, and ideas about how you can master the art of leadership. To prepare for this webinar, I did some research about what makes great leaders, and I chose four women that are recognized as leaders in their profession and industry. They all have some firsts behind them. They have first accomplishments. And they all at some time have made Forbes list of most powerful women, some more than one. Next. These women are Marilyn Hewson, Chairman, President, and CEO of Lockheed Martin, Mary Barra, Chairman and CEO of General Motors, Rosalind Brewer, Chief Operating Officer of Starbucks and former President and CEO of Sam's Club, and lastly, Ginny Rometty, Chairman and President and CEO of IBM. You all recognize these women as leaders. They all have what it takes. So what we're going to explore today and what I look for is, what is it that they have in common? Next. Next. So in my research, I found that they had five common themes that were true for all four of these women and many of the other women that I read about. All of them have a passion and a sense of purpose. They know their stuff. They have their, the education, the training, the skills, the experience to do their job. They thrive with change and are not afraid to take risks. They all exude confidence, and they all, at one point or another, have persevered in the face of adversity. Next, please. But first, I need, we need to start by asking why. And I'd like to start by asking, and for you to ask yourself, why do you want to be a leader? And we're going to explore four questions that are important for anyone that is aspiring to be a leader. First of all, you need to think about what season in your life are you in? How much effort, time, and energy you have to dedicate to your career makes a huge difference. I'll use my own personal example. Um, I worked through school. I also put, helped put my husband through medical school. We got married, and we had a child. And for the first few years of, of my life, really, all I wanted was not to get fired from whatever job I had. I needed to be able to make money to be able to support my family. So I really wasn't thinking of a career. I was thinking about keeping my job. It wasn't until later that I really started to concentrate on my career. However, especially for those of you that are starting out, I will tell you, that there is an advantage to starting early and to start planning your future as early as you can. Warren Buffett uses the analogy of compounding interest. You know, the same as when you start saving money early, the compounding interest helps your money grow, so does starting early with your career helps you advance. The next question that I'd like to ask, or for you to ask yourself is, what is your priority? Notice that I don't say priorities. To reach the echelons that these women have, you have to have single-minded determination. You won't, you won't have to give up everything, but I will tell you that other areas in your life will have to take a back seat. You, there's going to be lots of compromises that you're going to need to make. So that's why you need to know what is your priority. Third question is, what's important to you? Are you looking for power, money, success, leaving a legacy, building something, serving others, getting recognition? The answer to this question will help you decide how you will lead, because your values and your objectives will be different depending on what it is that you want to get out of leadership. Not one is better or worse, you just need to know what it is and know your true north. These are your values, and they will guide you to become, to be the leader that you will become. And lastly, but most importantly, what makes you happy? 
when your values align with your actions, you can be happy. Otherwise, it's very difficult. Knowing and living by your values is what makes an authentic leader. Think about a time in your life when you, everything just seemed to click. You felt truly happy. You had found your groove. Chances are you were living by your values. And again, I'm not going to tell you what those should be or what's going to make you happy, but I will tell you that being a leader is hard work. So you need to know what the answer to these questions to be able to put in all the time, energy, and effort that it's going to take. So I'll start telling you the stories of the women that I research, and we'll start with Mary Barra. Next, please. Um, Mary Barra became the first female CEO in 2014 in a very male-dominated auto industry. She became, she started at General Motors when she was 18. She worked through school. She moved up the ranks and became CEO 34 years later. There's a lot of work in those 34 years. She came from a working family. Her mom grew up in a farm during the Great Depression, her dad in an iron mining area of upper Minnesota. He worked at Pontiac all of his life, and that's how she got into the auto business. From them, she learned early on the value of hard work. She likes to roll up her sleeves and put all of her energy and passion into everything you do she does. There's hardly an interview where she doesn't talk about hard work and passion. She has faced some tough challenges, criticisms, and has stood up against some tough opponents. Shortly after being named CEO, the problem with the ignition of GM in GM's car came out. She had not been part of the team involved with the issue, but immediately she took responsibility and she got to work. She conducted an internal probe that resulted in 15 people getting fired. They recalled 2.6 million cars. She instituted many new policies, such as if you can't get it, if we can't do it right, don't do it. And she has dealt directly with consumers that have been impacted by the tragedies because of the uh, ignition in these cars. And she's been hard at work changing the culture. She advises that you have to love what you do so that it doesn't feel like work. She has not always loved all the jobs that she's had, so she knows the difference. I heard her say to students in a graduation um, speech that talent is not enough. You need passion and hard work. And she said, hard work beats talent if talent does not work hard. Let me say that again. Hard work beats talent if talent does not work hard. So keep that in mind. Um, you know, there is, Mary will tell you, next slide, that there is no magic bullet. All of the women that I've read about, they meet the minimum requirement is that they are prepared. They have a good education. They know their, their business. And that's what you have to do. You have to learn your business. You have to expose yourself to all aspects of your company and the industry. If you can get P&L experience, international experience, um, if you can position yourself in an area of the company where you're able to produce revenue or be part of a transformation, all of these things will help you in your career success. You have to invest in yourself and also in others. It's by helping others learn and grow is that you also develop yourself and that you have people that are going to help you along the way. And lastly, but very importantly, you have to learn to package yourself. Many times we're not very good at this, but you have to make your goals known. You have to develop relationships. You can't wait for someone to tap you on the shoulder because you're doing such a good job in your current role. I can tell you, it's not going to happen. Next slide, please. You sometimes there's debate about whether when when women get ahead, um, is it luck or is it hard work? Well, next, 
I will tell you that it's maybe. It's not yes, it's not no, it's maybe, and you need both. Without a doubt, hard work is essential. You have to show up early. But serendipity also plays a role. Time and place sometimes makes a big difference. And I have had this happen to me many, many, many times in my life where when I've when something has been right for me, the doors have opened. When something has not been right for me, it, it just has not worked out. And then looking back, I I realized that what happened was the best thing that could have happened. And so you have to. There is there is a, uh, a portion of of luck that that you have to be aware of, either good or bad. I also think that it's very important for all of us to never lose sight that the doors opening for you may be those that were opened by those that came before you. And similarly, your successes, your hard work, the diligence that you put into whatever it is you do will open the doors for others. I'd like to tell you the story about Rosalind Brewer. Rosalind is the, she's now the chief operating officer at Starbucks. Before joining Starbucks, she was president and CEO at Sam's Club, a division of Walmart. Um, Rosalind tells the story that one day, Howard Schultz, who was the um, CEO at Starbucks at, Starbucks at that time, um, came to Sam's Club for a panel discussion with Walmart's CEO, Doug McMillan. As you know, Sam's is a division of Walmart. At the last minute, Macmillan had to cancel and ask Rosalind to step in and take his place. Can you imagine being in that position? But she was ready. She had done her homework and she knew her stuff. That gave her the opportunity to be able to, to show what she could do. And then after that, she did the right thing. She maintained a relationship with Schultz. She stayed in touch and continued to, to build on that relationship. She also had the opportunity to build a relationship with Kevin Johnson, who at that time was the chief operating officer at Starbucks, and they were both on um, Starbucks board. There, Kevin Johnson had the opportunity to see the hard work, the diligence, and the smart that, that Rosalind had. And so when he stepped in and became CEO at Starbucks in March of 2017. He brought Rosalind right in. So she became uh, chief operating officer to replace him in September of 2017. None of these things would not have happened. None of these things would have happened, I should say, if Rosalind had not been ready that day when she took McMillan's place. And she made that positive impression and then she kept up her the hard work during her her uh, uh, position with her position on the Starbucks um, board, and she continued to pursue that relationship with both men. In an interview um, that I listened to, Rosalind talks about the need for sponsors, and she believes that sponsors can teach you the unwritten rules. I think that many of you probably have heard the debate about whether what is the difference between mentors and sponsors. So I like to try to draw the difference for you because it is an important difference. Mentors are advisors. They impart wisdom. They help you see your weaknesses. They celebrate your successes. They are the people you trust and are able to expose your vulnerability to. They have nothing to gain but the satisfaction of helping you become a better you. I'll use um, my writer's group. I, I like to write and I belong to several writer's groups. And it's all peers, some have been published, some have not, but the, the women and men in these writing groups really are not in a position to, to help but one another in any other way than really, um, you know, helping each other, supporting each other, sharing information, giving each other prompts um, so that we can do our writing, 
and just it, it they they really are just there as a peer group to be able to help each other out. Sponsors, on the other hand, they may have the same motives for helping you, but they are in a position to help you move ahead. They already see something in you that maybe you have not even recognized yet. They want and have the power to put in a recommendation, they, to say the right word in front of the right person, or bring up your name in meetings where decisions are made. If you have a chance to listen to Carla Harris' TED Talk, How to Find the Person Who Can Help You Get Ahead at Work, I highly recommend it. She shares some, some really interesting insights about what it takes sometimes to get ahead, and sponsors can play a big role. Recently, someone said to me that she had hit the jackpot when she started to work for someone that we both know. I knew exactly what she meant. This individual cared about her, cares about her and he wants her to, to see her prosper. I had the same experience with that individual and it's made a huge difference in my ability to get ahead. Next. In their book, How Women Rise, Sally Helgeson and Marshall Goldsmith Talk about how you don't have to wait to be fully prepared to take on the next challenge, and that women must stop trying to be perfect to rise to the top of their profession. Perfection can be your worst enemy. If you don't take anything away from this presentation, remember this slide. Imagine how terrifying it must be for that little duckling to jump into the water but jump it must. So will you, sometimes will have to jump. Sometimes you will have to take a leap of faith. You're gonna to have to jump and, and hope that the wings grow on the way down and it will be very scary, but you will have to do it anyways. Have you ever woken up in the middle of the night thinking about something you've done or failed to do? I know this has happened to me many times. You know, you just wake up and you're thinking about something you or someone else said or didn't say, the look that someone gave you, the, 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 the remark that somebody made, how your comment maybe was ignored. You just keep thinking about this over and over again and you keep dwelling on it. What could have done, what you should have done, what could have done, been done differently. That's rumination. Label it and stop it. Stop it on its track because it's, it's not helpful. There's a difference between reflecting on your mistakes and rumination. Mistakes can show you the areas in which we lack knowledge, competence, and understanding. They can clear our blind spots so that we can learn from them. But if it's just rumination without that learning, it just takes you down a dark hole and you don't learn anything from it. Also, I cannot tell you enough, don't try to know it all, to do it all. That can hurt you. You will be pigeonholed, you will stagnate because you don't have developed yourself or others. So you have to know how much you need to know, but not too many details because they will, they will hold you back. Let this be your mantra. Growth and comfort cannot coexist. Um, unfortunately, I did not come up with it. It's a quote from Ginny Rometty. Next. Ginny um, is the chair and president of CEO, excuse me, she's the president and CEO of IBM. Um, and, you know, as, as I was reading about her, I could just imagine being the one that has to transform a 100 plus year successful computer hardware company, you know, a giant in the field for so many years, um, to a data analytic, mobile, cloud, social type of company. And imagine getting all those IT guys to give up their toys. Can't be easy, but that's what Jimmy has been trying to do over the last seven years at the helm of IBM. 
he started at IBM as a system engineer in 1981 and worked her way up to CEO in 2012. That's over 30 years. Overnight success does not happen. She's been through many, many areas of the company. She has led IBM's transition to a data company, and here's some of the cool things that Jeannie has had to say. One, number one, you have to accept risk. That's when you learn the most. She tells the story of one, one time when she um, was offered a position and she turned it down because she did not think she was ready. Um, she went home, talked about it, and thought about it, and came back the next day and took the position. She says it was the best decision she ever made because she grew into the job. And from then on, she was able to continue to grow. She says that she asked herself, am I doing the things that only I can do? If others can do it, let them. Lastly, she likes to say, power is taking action in a moment that could make you feel powerless. You have to aim big and never let anyone else tell you what's possible. Never let someone define who you are. Next, there's something to be said, you know, about the saying, never let them see you sweat. And, you know, you, you have to be able to do what's, what you're fearful of, but still at the same time exude confidence, even, and most importantly, when you're not feeling it. I know all of you are saying, oh my God, she's so confident. Look at the mess with the computer, the technology at the beginning, and how confident she is. Well, thank you for thinking that, but I, what I've done is I've prepared for this presentation. We even prepared for technical glitches. And now I'm being present. The only thing I can do is I can be present to try to do the best presentation that I can for you. I can't control what happened and how the presentation started. I can't worry about whether or not you, you, everyone's going to like it or what they're going to think about it. But I can tell you that I'm present and I'm trying to do the very best. So that's why you think I'm, I'm confident. If you don't think I'm being confident, don't say anything. That's my attempt at the second thing that can help you exude confidence. You have to have a sense of humor. You have to be able to um, not take yourself so seriously. Even if I blow it today, it's not going to be the end of the world. So, you know, we have to give ourselves a break. We can't be so hard on ourselves. We can't take ourselves um, so seriously because when we do, not only do we not exude confidence, we give up our power. And remember, we have more power than we think. That's what gives you confidence. I'll share with you one other example. And this is the example of Dolores Huerta. Um, many of you, next please. Many of you probably haven't heard of Dolores, but I know of her because um, in the 70s when I was in high school, she and Cesar Chavez co-founded the National Farm Workers Association. Um, and at that time, they were really um, a, the only voice for migrant workers. And I took up the cost, and um, I boycotted California grapes, which I loved, and, and I protested, and I felt empowered um, to try to do what I could for the, those, the migrants that no one was caring for. But Dolores so, so, so I remember Dolores from that time. And she tells the story of when she was a young worker uh, at, a, at an office, and a disabled migrant came in, and he needed help getting some forms filled out. So her boss sent her to the appropriate office to, so she could help the guy. When she got there, the person at the desk said, no, we can't help you. No, you, we can't do it. So she came back to her boss and says, you know, they said we couldn't do it. He just said to her, yes, you can, and marched her right back to, um, to, to go back and get the job done. So she did, she went back in, she asked to speak to the person superior, and she got it done. She says that that lesson remained with her for the rest of her life. 
So just like Dolores, you have the power and you have to use it. Now we'll talk briefly about how to communicate with confidence. The numbers up on the next screen, 20,000 to 7,000. Hold on to that ratio, we will be right back to it. In communicating with confidence, there are two things that are a must, and without this, there's, there's, there's nothing to really be done. First, you have to speak the truth, honesty and integrity in everything that you do, even when it's not convenient. That's how you build credibility, and that's the currency that you have. Without that, we might not even be talking today. But at the same time, you don't have to give them your complete playbook. This is something I struggle with, and it's something that is very common in women. We tend to talk too much. We want it, it's great for building relationships, but we give sometimes too many explanations. We, we talk too much about the why we're doing things, when people may just need to know the what's, right? And so, although explaining and, 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 and talking are good things to build relationships, it can be a hindrance in a male-dominated world. So, especially when it comes to being see, to be seen uh, confident. So, you know, just be, just think about this. Whenever you have a message that you need to communicate, you need to try to really understand what it is that you're trying to say and be as clear, direct, and succinct as you can. That ratio of 20,000 to 7,000 is the ratio of words spoken daily by women compared to men. Incredible to believe, but somebody is counting those things. And so, you know, that's all I'm going to say in case someone is counting today. Next, please. Marilyn Hewson. That's her picture there. Look how confident. Look at that smile. Her story illustrates some of those points I've been making. She's the chairman and president and CEO of Lockheed Martin. Um, she's, been, she's had that position since 2013. She has worked at four of the five Lockheed Martin divisions. She started in 1983, another overnight success with over 25 years in the making. Marilyn likes to say that it takes courage to make mistakes. When you listen to Marilyn, she exudes confidence. She has that warm smile. She's known for her sense of humor and self-effacing manner. But she loves the challenge. She can get very focused and is known as a driver. She executes and gets things done. She's tough and determined. But when asked to look back, she will be the first to tell you that not everything has gone well for her. And she attributes her success to a collection of small breaks. At the same time, she doesn't regret the failures that she's made and the mistakes that she's made. And she now wishes she had taken more risks. She, like so many of the other women I, t I talked about, you know, has learned to persevere in the face of adversity. It hasn't been an easy ride for any of them. And who knows what their future will bring, but they have made their mark. I'll use Gisha Williams uh, example. Some of you may know Gisha. She just recently resigned from PG&E. And, um, you know, she became um, the, 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 the CEO and chair of, chairman of um, PG&E in 2017. Um, you know, she was the very first Hispanic woman to head one of the nation's largest utilities, first Hispanic woman in any Fortune 500 company. As you can tell by my name, I'm also Hispanic. And similarly to Keisha, um, you know, I was born in Cuba. I came to this country at a young age. I lived in Miami, and so did she. She went to work for Florida Power and Light, and I went to work at People's Gas. From FPL, her career skyrocketed. But I've always related to her, and I have been rooting for her and also praying for her because, as you know, right, PG&E, has been going through a difficult um, time and they face an uncertain future. 
The utility has billions of dollars in liability for its role in Cal the California wildfires. You know, their shares have declined dramatically. They're, they file for bankruptcy. They could even be facing criminal charges. We don't know the cost or the story behind Geisha's departure. I used her story because I cannot imagine being any, under any more pressure and facing more of a ch leadership um, challenge. I also want to make the point that sometimes things do not work out, but that doesn't mean that you don't try. The lesson is that you pick yourself up and you start again, and I hope Geisha will do that. She has led the utility through turbulent times, and I hope that she, like other women, the other women we've been talking about, will persevere. In times of uncertainty, leaders emerge. In his book, um, Josh, uh, The Art of Learning, by uh, the master chess player Josh Watkins, he talks about that losing is not all bad and that to win you have to be willing to lose. And it is okay to be vulnerable and to embrace lo losses as learning opportunities. So don't dwell on the negatives. Don't dwell on the failures and the losses. You've got to roll with the punches and be resilient. The next picture I'm about to show you reminded me of my dog, Charlie. I have an 11-year-old golden retriever. And if you have dogs, you know exactly what this picture means. You know, when you give them a bath and you're about to towel them down and to dry them, they don't like that. They would prefer to just go into the deep trance and just shake it all off. And Charlie loves to do this. And so I thought of this because in your career, in your, um, in your life, you're going to encounter adversity and you have to learn to shake things off, whether it's sexism, any kind of discrimination, negativity, backstabbing, people ignoring your ideas, the looks that sometimes you get, you're, you're going to need to figure out how, just like Charlie, shake it off. Remember that you're a success because of your hard work, what you do, who you are. You're not being a success because someone's trying to let you get ahead by giving you a handout. So when things don't go your way, Shake it off and keep on going. So to, uh, to wrap up, figuring out your passion and sense of purpose, investing in yourself and being ready, taking risks and changing the world, persevering in the face of adversity, all while looking confident and sure of yourself is hard work. So I'd like to leave you with one thing. You need to take time to take care of yourself. You need to take time to just rest, take time off. It can't all be work, work, work. Just stop and do nothing every once in a while. It's, you need to learn the art of relaxing. It takes time to learn to relax and it takes practice. Remember, breathe in, breathe out. If you haven't tried meditation, I strongly recommend it as a way to relax. You need to learn to rejuvenate yourself, pamper yourself, disconnect, have some fun, let somebody else take care of you. And lastly, you need to re rejoice because you've achieved enough, you're good enough, you can be grateful for what you've achieved so far, and you've got this. Thank you, and I hope you've enjoyed my presentation. Oh, thank you, Alita. That has been a great presentation. I'm sure everyone's enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, we've had some questions come in, so I just want to go ahead and jump right to those if you're ready. Uh, okay, I try to question? hurry along so we would have time for questions. <laughs> you did wonderfully. We thank you for that. Um, the first question we have is, um, what do you think about mentoring group versus individual mentors? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I have found in my life that it's, it's hard to find um, mentors that, that, that are really, that have the time and are able to dedicate the, you know, and, and arrange their schedule with yours. You know, you, you, there are times when you are able to, you're lucky that you have someone that wants to spend the time uh, with you. 
Um, I have, have had more luck, like I said, with my writers uh, group, which I consider that a mentoring peer group. We're experimenting with that at our company, um, and uh, you know the jury's still out to see what what's best. But whether it's individual or a group, um, mentoring is a critical uh, part of anyone's development, and and they should be encouraged and practiced. Yes, great, good. Um, there's a quick question though. Someone's asking what book, uh, what was the name of the book, title of the book that you recommend earlier about career advancement. Uh, it was um, How Women Rise, Sally Helgeson and Marshall Goldsmith. Okay, great. We'll make note of that. Um, another question came in, and it's uh, going back to uh, Geisha's story. What do you think her leaving PG&E might mean for women in general? Um, I hope that it doesn't mean much. Um, I will say that it is sad because there's so few of us in these top positions. So whenever you see something like this happen, you know, it, it kind of shakes us. But there's men getting, um, you know, leaving organizations all the time. There's men changing positions all the time. There's men that, you know, face similar situations all the time and the world goes on. And so I think the same will be uh, for Geisha, which is, you know, our numbers are fewer, but um, she, 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 will, she will be fine and so will we. Yes, I agree. That was my thoughts about that exactly. Um, I had another question came, come in um, and it was regarding mentors and sponsors about, uh, the, about when you've had to separate yourself from a mentor or a sponsor. Um, has that ever occurred to you or happened to you? Or do you have any thoughts about that? When you when you've had to separate yourself from a mentor or a sponsor because the relationship did not work out, I'm assuming. Yes, uh, that's, that that's yes, what, that's the what way. It is. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, that's how I'm interpreting it. Sure. Um, I, I guess I've been fortunate. I have not had that situation occur to me. Um, it. As I said, uh, finding a mentor is difficult, so I would imagine that, um, you know, a relationship that that, that, that turns sour, uh, it, it must be very bad. But I will tell you this, that for a mentor mentorship to work, there's got to be mutual um, uh, respect, and both parties have got to be willing to invest the time. The investor, of his or his or her time to help the the person that wants to be mentored, and but it also it takes a lot for the mentee to really you know want to to participate in that relationship, make it work, um, dedicate the the time to follow through on maybe assignments and uh, and uh, and 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 doing the hard work that hopefully that mentor is asking him or her to to do. Yeah. Okay, very good. So another question has come in. Um, this uh, attendee would like to know what you identified as your biggest weakness and then how did you overcome it? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> my biggest weakness. Um, and I don't think I've overcome it. And so that the ratio that I mentioned to you and the reason why that caught my attention is because that's probably one of my biggest uh, issues. I was in, at another conference last week, and a young woman just starting out um, did a presentation, and she talked about how we, women sometimes were our own worst enemies because we hem and hum, and we do, we're not very direct, and we don't always say things um, as as clearly and as succinctly as we we should, and that's me. I, I get ahead of myself, I talk faster than, than I think my brain is going, and then I probably give too many explanations. So that's probably my biggest weakness. Um, and um, I, I don't know, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I'm already uh, ready to retire, and I don't, I'm not sure I'm gonna overcome it be, between now and my retirement date, but I'll keep trying. 
too funny. Um, uh, I think we've got one more question that I really want you to have uh, an opportunity to speak to. But, um, the attendee says the women leaders you mentioned at those had been at those companies for a long time, establishing themselves there. Do you have any tips for advancing when you are new to a company? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I find it interesting that most of us want to advance and, and, and feel that we're not advancing fast enough. And, and it, it wasn't on purpose that I found and I, and, I, uh, and I covered three women that had all been with their companies for a very long time. Um, it, you, you have to be patient. You have to be willing to do some jobs that maybe um, are not particularly glamorous. You have to be willing to put in the, the, the time and the, and the long hours. And while you're putting yourself out there that you do want to advance, you have to demonstrate that you're willing to do what it takes um, to get ahead. And sometimes, you know, we, we get ahead of ourselves by trying to, to get ahead too fast. Um, you know, I'm not saying that everybody has to spend 30 years at a company um, to get ahead. It, certainly, there there are lots of women that move ahead a lot faster. But there are no shortcuts. There are no there are no easy path. It it takes a long time. I think that the number one thing that I would advise is make sure that people know that you are interested in in getting ahead and in growing with the company and then do the hard work to make that happen. Okay, very good. I think maybe um, we have time for just one more question. Um, this question that uh, attendee asks, um, I'm in a dead-end job and I hate it. What should I do? <laughs> well, go back to, you know, your what season in your life. If you're the, the breadwinner in and, and this situation and quitting your job, would mean being homeless, you're gonna to have to stick it out for a while. But if you can, get out as quickly as possible. It's probably not gonna get any better. Um, and um, you know, don't, don't quit too soon on, your com on the company that you're in right now. Try to see if you can find other things that you can do. But at some point, you're, you're gonna to have to decide that what really you want out of, out of your life. And being in a dead end job is probably not. We have time for one more. This one just came in, and I really think it it, uh, it needs to be uh, aired. Uh, this attendee says, "I move frequently from my husband's job. I'd like to move into leadership, but haven't stayed at a company more than a few years. Does that mean I can never move up?" No, no, no. Because you've gained experience from each of those jobs. Hopefully, you've been you've either have stayed within an industry or maybe within a, a, a type of, of field in your moves having been erratic, you know, from one type of profession to the other. But no, um, you know, it, 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 the, the, the fact that these women stayed at these companies for a long time is not the determining factor. You can, you can still get ahead and even if you've had to move multiple times. I agree. I, I think that just adds value to her uh, skill sets and the different talents that she would bring to whatever position she came to next. That's exactly right. So, uh, Alita, we have a question here. Who has uh, asked um, Alita, is she willing to give these talks during retirement? We so desperately need to continue hearing from her. That's very sweet. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I have a feeling I may know where that's coming from. <laughs> Thank uh, you, everyone. <laughs> you're welcome. Well, okay, we're near. It's been the, my pleasure. Oh yeah, we're near the top of the hour, so I want to be respectful of the time that we've had for this uh, presentation. But thank you so much, Alita, for being here with us, uh, for your patience going through the technical difficulties on the beginning, and being such a trooper to deliver us here to the ending point. Um, I want to uh, remind folks of the Conference, uh, Conference 43 in Phoenix and the workshop, Mastering the Art of Mentorship. Um, this is uh, being given as part of the Women Utilities uh, webinar series in conjunction with our workshops. And so we also want you to not forget to register for the Sunrise event 
at Conference 43 in Phoenix. And then join us in May uh, for the conclusion of our series with Mastering the Art of Negotiation. And our presenter is Sharon Grove with uh, LADWP. And we hope that you, uh, we'll have a date out for that in May here pretty soon. We'll hope you join us. And with that, I just want to again uh, close by saying thank you, Alita. We really appreciate you. And we also appreciate our webinar series sponsor, AAC Utility Partners. And Christine, thank you for joining us today as well. We've enjoyed having you with us. Thank you, everyone, much. for coming. Yep. Thank, thank you. you. This, will, this will conclude the webinar.